Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Without a doubt, New Jersey's oldest, most enduring, and important pieces of folklore is the tale of the infamous Jersey Devil. For close to 300 years now, Jerseyans have told tales of this mythical beast that stalks the Pine Barrens and terrorizes local residents. The recurring nature of this story begs a few questions. Why have New Jerseyans embraced this legend so steadfastly and above all others? Is there actually some sort of creature roaming the Pine Barrens of southern New Jersey? And if so, what on earth is it? Legend has it that in 1735, a Pines resident known as Mother Leeds found herself pregnant for the thirteenth time. Leeds is the name of one of New Jersey's earliest settlers, and many descendants of the Leeds family can still be found throughout New Jersey to this day. Mother Leeds was not living a wealthy lifestyle by any means. Her husband was a drunkard who made few efforts to provide for his wife and twelve children. Reaching the point of absolute exasperation upon learning of her thirteenth child, she raised her hands to the heavens and proclaimed, let this one be a devil. Mother Leeds went into labor a few months later. On a tumultuously stormy night, no longer mindful of the curse she had uttered previously regarding her unborn child. Her children and husband huddled together in one room of their Leeds Point home while local midwives gathered to deliver the baby in another. By all accounts, the birth went routinely, and the 13th Leeds child was a seemingly normal baby boy. Within minutes, however, Mother Leeds' unholy wish of months before began to come to fruition the baby started to change and metamorphosed right before her very eyes. Within moments, it transformed from a beautiful newborn baby into a hideous creature unlike anything the world had ever seen. The wailing infant began growing at an incredible rate. It sprouted horns from the top of its head and talon-like claws tore through the tips of its fingers leathery bat-like wings unfurled from its back, and hair and feathers sprouted all over the child's body. Its eyes began glowing bright red as they grew larger in the monster's gnarled and snarling face. The creature savagely attacked its own mother, killing her, then turned its attention to the rest of the horrified onlookers who witnessed its tempestuous transformation. It flew at them, clawing and biting voicing unearthly shrieks the entire time. It tore the midwives limb from limb, maiming some and killing others. The monster then knocked down the door to the next room where its own father and siblings cowered in fear and attacked them all, killing as many as it could. Those who survived to tell the tale then watched in horror as the rotten beast sprinted to the chimney and flew up it, destroying it on the way and leaving a pile of rubble in its wake. The creature then made good its escape into the darkness and desolation of the Pine Barrens, where it has lived ever since. To this day, the creature, known varyingly as the Leeds Devil and the Jersey Devil, claims the Pines as its own and terrorizes any who are unfortunate enough to encounter it. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, without a doubt New Jersey's oldest, most enduring and important piece of folklore is the tale of the infamous Jersey Devil. For 300 years, Jerseyans have told tales of this mythical beast that stalks the Pine Barrens and terrorizes local residents. But is it merely a legend, or could there truly be some kind of real creature 
that fits the horrifying description. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The legends of the Jersey Devil stretch back hundreds of years and, like many such legends, are a mixture of half-truths, twisted perspective, and blurry recollections. Sightings of this apparently mythical creature continue today, however, leading some to suspect there may be more to the accounts than just mere stories. While the origins, and indeed the vast majority of descriptions of the Jersey Devil have their roots in the practicing of dark arts, the summoning of demonic entities, and claims of the devil himself, it is entirely possible if such a creature does exist, it is one that has, as unlikely as it might be, avoided detection and study from the modern world. Indeed, Perhaps it is even some kind of humanoid who once called the open plains of New Jersey home. Many features of the Jersey Devil sightings also come up in the equally bizarre spring-heeled jack sightings of the mid-19th century to the early 1900s in England, predominantly in London. Such things as a leaping or flying ability or strange claw-like feet. Even more bizarre are details of flames or a strange glow in accounts of each of these strange creatures. Might there be a connection, or are the sightings simply a testament to overactive imaginations? One of the first accounts on record, and the one most associated with the legends of the Jersey Devil, goes back to the Pine Barrens area of South New Jersey in 1735. There, a lady by the name of Jane Leeds announced she was pregnant with no less than her thirteenth child. To all who would listen, she would say, the devil can take this one. According to the legend, this thirteenth child had the shape of a human, but the look of a reptile. Details state the child was born with claws, a tail, and horns. It would grow exceptionally quickly, with some accounts stating up to twenty feet in height. It would leave the Leeds household through the chimney and vanish. The legends and stories of the Jersey Devil, at the time often called the Leeds Devil, began to thrive soon after. However, it is likely that the use of the Leeds name is due to the writings and ideas of one of the pilgrims to the New World of America. Daniel Leeds, who records show arrived in Burlington, New Jersey in 1677. Like many of the new immigrants, Leeds was a member of the Society of Friends, more commonly known as the Quakers. Born in Leeds, Yorkshire in England in 1651, the 24-year-old was a devout follower of his religion. He was also a man with interests in pagan rituals and beliefs who himself had visions from an early age. It was these interests and Leeds' own background which would ultimately lead the Quaker community to turn on him. In doing so, particularly as their community would submit to the industrialization of the coming decades of the once open countryside, they had sown the seed of the legends that would follow. Daniel Leeds was well educated in such ancient arts as astrology and methods of what we would call today alternative healing. At the time, the Quaker population increasingly regarded these teachings of Leeds as being black magic and even satanic. Leaflets were regularly distributed around Quaker settlements and into the wider populations. Perhaps Leeds' loyalty to the British also put him at odds with the locals. Furthermore, the Leeds family crest was of three dragon-like creatures, which only further aroused suspicions and, in the minds of the settlers, strengthened the links between Daniel Leeds and what future generations would call the Jersey Devil. An apparent exorcism in 1740 
claimed to banish the creature from the area for 100 years. The legends, however, would continue throughout the centuries and into modern times. Upon the discovery of bog iron in the New Jersey region, the population rapidly grew as industries gave birth to communities, towns, and eventually cities. There would also be an increase in sightings. In 1800, Commodore Stephen Decatur, a naval hero of his time, would visit the Hanover Iron Works to test the cannonballs the plant produced. While doing so one particular day, he would report a strange winged creature flying over the firing range. Another sighting came from the brother of Napoleon, Joseph Bonaparte, in the early 1820s, who claimed to see the Jersey Devil while hunting game in the region. The stories and claimed sightings spread throughout the populations around New Jersey. Claims that farmers' sheep had been snatched from their pens or that the beast would prey on children out after dark would lead to many people hanging lanterns on their doorsteps in hopes of keeping the Jersey Devil at bay. There were several intriguing encounters throughout 1899 in the New Jersey region, many of which are documented in the book Monsters of New Jersey – Mysterious Creatures in the Garden State by Lauren Coleman. I'll place a link to that in the show notes. In fact, some reports even came from as far away as New York, where one resident, a local farmer, reported blood-curdling screams in the middle of the night before discovering several of his sheep missing the following day. In Woodbury, New Jersey, on the evening of the 16th going into the 17th of January, a gentleman who was walking out of a hotel suddenly heard a hissing sound. As he looked around, he noticed a strange white creature flying over the road. As it flew, the hotel guest noticed glowing eyes looking at him and would later state that it moved as fast as an auto. On the same evening in Burlington, local resident Joseph Loudon, along with the rest of his family, noticed a strange noise, like some heavy body trampling in the snow in the yard. More chilling, though, was when this strange creature, whatever it was, began moving around the house, doing several laps before attempting to gain entry through the back door. After several tense moments, it suddenly left. When the Loudon family investigated outside, they could see strange, beast-like footprints in the snow all around their home. Another resident from Gloucester City also noticed bizarre footprints in the snow. He would follow them through several gardens before they appeared to stop after entering a junkyard. Just over 24 hours later, on the morning of January 18th, back in the Burlington area of the city, the Loudons would discover more of the disturbing footprints outside their house. This time, instead of going around the house, they were impressed into the snow near the garbage can. When the family inspected closer, they could see a rubbish and half-eaten thrown-away food had been emptied onto the ground as if someone or something was searching through it. As news spread around the town, residents began to treat the incident of the Loudon family seriously. Many would bolt their doors and windows long before dark, refusing to go outside. The following evening, another batch of encounters would unfold. In the early hours of January 19th, at a little after 2.30 a.m. in Gloucester City, Mr. and Mrs. Evans were in bed when the most bizarre of noises dragged them from sleep. Each of them sat up and turned their attention to their bedroom window. Much to their surprise, sitting upon the roof of their shed was the Jersey Devil. Mr. Evans would later state that the creature was around three feet high and had a head like a collie dog and a face like a horse. What's more, its long neck stretched to a back that contained wings about two feet long. It also had crane-like legs upon which it stood upright with two short front legs with paws. He would eventually open the window in an attempt to scare the strange creature away. When he did so, however, it would turn to face him before barking and flying away. After reporting the sighting, two hunters would trail the apparent tracks of the creature for several miles. According to the route it appeared to take, it was able to leap high enough to jump over fences five feet high. Several similar incidents would unfold in the days that would follow. 
As January 19th went on, more and more sightings of strange footprints, and on some occasions even the creature itself were reported. One such sighting in Camden, for example, resulted in a report claiming that the creature was something like a possum the size of a dog with a shrill bark before flapping its wings and taking off into the air. In the town of Swedesboro, another report surfaced of a bizarre creature with something similar to antlers or horns on its head. Another discovery of strange footprints came from Glassboro, which were described as being dog-like with three toes. The following day, on January 20th, a policeman in Burlington would report a menacing figure whose eyes were like blazing coals. On the same day, in Pemberton, Reverend John Purcell would report a creature that he had never seen anything like previously. Other sightings came from nearby Haddonfield and Collingsworth. There was also an incident in Moorestown. Local resident John Smith would not only witness the strange monster-like creature, but he would give chase to it before it seemingly vanished into thin air in a nearby pit. He would later describe the creature as being around three feet high with long black hair over its entire body. He would elaborate that it had arms and hands like a monkey, a face like a dog, hoof-like feet, and a tail. A little later on the same day, in Springside, a trolley car operator noticed a bizarre figure crossing over the tracks ahead of him. He would later describe it as being like a winged kangaroo with a long neck. A little later that evening, Joseph Manns would discover the dead body of his puppy, seemingly the victim of an animal attack. He would also discover strange footprints around the buildings which housed his chickens. The following day, at around 1 a.m. on January 21st in Camden, several members of the Black Hawk Social Club heard a most bizarre sound outside. When the noise came again, this time much closer at the back window of the club, one of those inside turned to see a monstrous-looking creature staring inside at them. The creature remained where it was for several moments before it turned and disappeared, making the chilling screaming sounds as it did so. Around an hour later, in Haddon Heights, a trolley passenger witnessed a similarly bizarre creature through the window. They soon alerted the other passengers who all turned in the same direction and saw a strange flying creature overhead. When the car came to a stop, the winged figure appeared to circle them from above before unleashing a terrible hissing noise and flying off into the distance. The conductor of the trolley would later state the creature appeared similar to a kangaroo with a long neck and a head that was hideous. Even in the darkness, the creature appeared black and its wingspan was relatively wide. Another appearance of the Jersey Devil was reported a short time later in Trenton, when the horse carrying William Cromley suddenly went into a panic. When he climbed down from the cart, he witnessed a beast of fur and feathers which appeared to be as large as an average dog and had large, sparkling eyes. A little while later, also in Trenton, Mr. Whedon was brought from sleep by the sound of what he thought was someone trying to break into his home. As he approached the front windows, he was suddenly aware of the sounds of wings flapping outside his house. Upon opening the front door a short time later, he saw hoof prints on the ground outside. Further investigations by the local council would discover similar prints around the entire town. More sightings of the Jersey Devil and thoughts about what it might be up next. October is not only our favorite month due to Halloween and it also being the anniversary of the podcast, but for me, it's the busiest month. October crept up on me fast this year, and on the last day of September, I was scrambling to get things done late into the night. Because I knew it would be a late night, I grabbed a Magic Mind performance shot in the late afternoon and it gave me the mental clarity, alertness, and motivation I needed to get everything done before October rolled in. I'm relying more and more on Magic Mind than the energy drinks I used to live on. Not only does it work better and last longer without the energy drink crash, but it's also a healthier alternative. Fewer calories, fewer carbs, tons of essential vitamins, and that added benefit of a small dose of caffeine for that kickstart I need when starting my day. 
I became a subscriber, so I would never accidentally run out of Magic Mind. It's that effective for me. And because you are a Weird Darkness weirdo, you can try Magic Mind and get it at 48% off your subscription. Visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get the deal. If you'd rather just try it without a subscription, this code will also work for a one-time purchase and you'll get 20% off. Make Magic Mind part of your daily routine and you will definitely notice a difference. Again, visit magicmind.com slash weirddarkness and then use the promo code DARKNESS20 to get 48% off your subscription or 20% off a one-time purchase. MagicMind.com slash WeirdDarkness, promo code DARKNESS20. While these sightings and encounters were happening, regular reports were coming from farmers in the region claiming their poultry and other livestock were suffering attacks from something during the night. Even trolley cars ran with armed guards in case further sightings of the Jersey Devil occurred. In Burlington, at a little after 6 a.m., a local resident saw a bird-like feathered creature in an alley near her home. From her perspective, it appeared as though the strange creature was about to jump into the air. She remained where she was for several minutes, so frightened she couldn't even scream. She would eventually find the strength to turn and run back into her house to awaken her youngest son as he was the only other member of the family still at home. Although the creature had gone by the time they returned to the alley, there were several hoof prints in the snow that had recently been made. Several other sightings came a short time later from Mount Holly. Job Shin would claim to have seen a creature with a horse-like head, long hind legs with claws and big wings. Even more disturbing, when it landed, it walked as a human would. William Cronk, on the other hand, would spot a similar-looking creature flying over the top of his home and garden. In Westville, two women were attending a meeting when they happened to turn their attention to the snowy scene outside the window. However, what they saw shocked them both. On the snow-covered lawn outside was the Jersey Devil. They watched for several moments before the figure flew off into the air. A short time later, in the West Collingsworth region of the state, two men saw a strange creature sitting on the roof of a friend's house. They at first believed it to be an ostrich, but after the fire service aimed a stream of water toward it, they realized it was in fact the Jersey Devil. What made the incident even more disturbing was the fact that instead of fleeing, the creature turned and flew toward the witnesses. The crowd that had now gathered began to throw anything they could find at the winged aggressor until it eventually did turn and head into the distance. Mary Sorbinski was inside her house when she could suddenly hear the desperate cries of her dog. As she rushed outside, her eyes fixed upon a bizarre creature attacking her beloved pet. She managed to chase it away with a broom, but not before the dog suffered a nasty bite to its side. Mary would call the police, notifying them of the attack. Patrol officers arrived at the property shortly after, by which time a large crowd of around a hundred people had gathered. All around them were sounds of screeching and howls. Above them, shadows of something flying through the clouds were seen. The officers would attempt to shoot the creature, but all of their bullets appeared to miss their target. Shortly after, the noise ceased and the creature was gone. The day after Sorbinski's encounter came even further sightings. At a little after 2 a.m. on the 22nd of January, the residents of a home awoke to hear something moving around on the roof. Only two hours later, Louis Stair, a local policeman, would see a creature similar to the Jersey Devil seemingly drinking from a horse trough. As many others had described it, it had the head and body of a kangaroo, antlers like a deer, and bat wings. Indeed, things became so bad that many schools in the area were temporarily shut, as did many offices. And those that remained open found that many of their employees rang them with sudden illnesses that forced them to stay at home. 
What is also interesting, although we won't delve into it here, is that the state of Pennsylvania also experienced sporadic sightings during the opening weeks of January. And while there's no proof that it was the same creature that was terrorizing New Jersey, it is highly likely that it was. Of course, it is equally likely that there was and perhaps is more than one of the Jersey Devil creatures. Whatever the case, the regular, almost daily sightings of the Jersey Devil in the opening weeks of 1899 suddenly came to a stop. They would, however, begin again, although much less regular, as the 20th century began. While walking his usual patrol beat around New Jersey one evening in January 1909, James Sackville, a young police officer, claimed to see the Jersey Devil come out of an alleyway and into the street in front of him. He would withdraw and fire his revolver toward the creature, but according to his report it would spread its wings and disappear into the night sky. Although the Sackville sighting wasn't common knowledge among the local population, a flood of sightings soon came in. Shortly after Sackville's sighting, a report would come from the postmaster of Bristol, a town in Pennsylvania on the border with New Jersey, E.W. Minster. According to Minster, an eerie, almost supernatural sound awoke him shortly after 2 a.m. It appeared to be coming from the banks of the Delaware River. Upon looking out of his window, he could see a strange creature like a large crane flying over the icy water. It seemed to have a strange glow to it and made the sound again, confirming to Minster it was the sound that had awoken him. Shortly after, it would vanish. On January 19th, Nelson Evans and his wife would report a large creature on their roof. The description was bizarre, to say the least, with features of a horse, a dog, and a crane, as well as huge wings. Several days later, in the middle of the day, Mrs. White claimed to see the creature huddled in the corner of the yard while she retrieved clothes from the washing line. Her screams brought her husband to the door, who claimed he could see spurting flames coming from the creature. It would leap over the fence of the garden and disappear. Shortly after came another sighting, one witnessed by hundreds. Although much more sporadic, the sightings continued throughout the 1900s. In 1927, while changing a flat tire on his taxi cab, a driver would witness a winged creature leap onto the roof of his vehicle and pound it violently. He climbed into his car and drove away as fast as he could. In August 1930, at the Leeds Point in May's Landing, multiple berry pickers witnessed a strange creature flying over and through the fields. In 1951, a report would come from a group of children of seeing the Jersey Devil in Gibbstown. Several more sightings came in later the same evening in the same area. In 1993, Forest Ranger John Irwin claimed to be driving alongside the Mullica River. Out of nowhere, a six-foot winged creature stood in the road in front of him. After remaining still for several moments, what Irwin is certain he saw was the Jersey Devil turning away from him. It ran into the forest at the side of the road. Sightings of the Jersey Devil would continue into the latter decades of the 20th century. In 1972, for example, on a street named Green Tree Road that went through several towns in the southern part of the state, a woman traveling toward the town of Glasboro, Mary Christensen, would suddenly notice a bizarre creature in her rearview mirror. She would later state that the creature had a horse-like head and legs similar to a goat. However, more worryingly, it stood upright as a human would, with a pair of leather-like wings spanning each side. Christensen would guess that the bizarre animal was around 25 feet from her vehicle at the time of the sighting. Little else is known of the sighting, other than Christensen left the area and the creature behind with alacrity. Local media would pick up on the incident, though, and it remains in circulation online and among like-minded researchers. Although many sightings of the Jersey Devil are around the Pine Barrens region of the state, if this sighting is credible and accurate, it would suggest once again that this strange creature, whatever it might one day prove to be, can perhaps travel further distances than we might currently think. If we return to the Pine Barrens area, though, 
we can examine what are the most chilling incidents involving the Jersey Devil of relatively recent times. The first of these occurred in 1980 in the Wharton State Forest, which is pretty much the center of the region. On the day in question, a forest ranger, Alan McFarlane, received a call to attend a farm that sat close to the forest. When he arrived there, he discovered that all of the farmer's pigs had been butchered during the night. Even more disturbing was the fact that each of the back of the pig's heads had been gnarled at and eaten. What's more, most of the unfortunate pigs had deep scratch marks on their backs. This appeared to McFarlane that some beast had clawed to their backs while eating the brains of the pigs, especially as no other part of the body contained any wounds whatsoever. What is particularly chilling about this incident, one that McFarlane claimed was one of the most morbidly intriguing he has ever witnessed, is that it remains unexplained and unsolved. It is perhaps one of the more credible cases for some kind of strange and aggressive animal roaming around the New Jersey woodland. Several years later, another unnerving incident was reported. On the day in question, a group of friends who were camping in the Pine Barrens woodland as part of a dirt bike riding holiday were riding around the woodland. Suddenly, and for no reason, each of their bike engines suddenly stalled, bringing their vehicles to a stop. At the same time, each of the group heard a fear-inducing scream coming from the woodland around them. Although it appeared to be a considerable distance away, it was something not human, but not like any animal any of them had heard before. Initially, the men forgot about their bikes and ran from the scene back to their campsite. They would return a little later to retrieve the bikes, with some of them opting to leave the forest and return home. Those that remained would hear the terrible screaming sounds later on during the night. Whether those cries belonged to the Jersey Devil remains open to debate. Around the same time, the owner of the Smithville Inn, Fran Coppola, had her own encounter with the New Jersey Devil. As she was emptying rubbish outside, she suddenly noticed a large shadow pass over her from above. When she turned her attention to the sky, she could see a large, winged creature above her. Although she didn't manage to capture a picture of the strange winged figure, she would go on record with her belief that what she witnessed was indeed the Jersey Devil. In October 2015, Dave Black would claim to have witnessed the Jersey Devil making its way across a New Jersey golf course. Furthermore, Black managed to snap a picture of the elusive beast. He would speak to his encounter to NJ.com, claiming to be driving past the golf course along Route 9 in Galloway when something strange captured his attention. Black turned to what he at first thought was a llama. He kept the strange creature in his sight for a few moments. It was then that it spread out leathery wings and flew off over the golf course. Black would make it clear that he was not seeking any kind of monetary compensation for the picture he was looking to see if anyone could explain the sightings in a more rational way. When pressed on the issue, Black would insist the picture was not a hoax. The wings of the creature are clearly visible, as are what appears to be horns on its head. Some explanations of it being a piñata suspended on strings, however, appear to fall short. No strings are visible, and furthermore, there would appear to be nowhere to attach the strings to. He offered he had considered the picture might show a small land mammal, possibly captured by a large owl. Black, however, has his own thoughts. He would state, I think I saw a large flying mammal about the size of a deer. It does appear, as bizarre as the picture looks, that Black's photograph is genuine. Whether it's one day proven to be a hoax or not, only time will tell. I'll link to the photo in the show notes so you can take a look at it for yourself. The Jersey Devil, if only in people's minds, is apparently alive and well. So what should we make of the legends of the Jersey Devil? As we have seen, like all legends, they are a mixture of both fact and hearsay, recorded information and the differing retelling of accounts. There are several interesting points of the legends to consider, though, perhaps not least the similarities to the previously mentioned Spring-Heeled Jack sightings of 1800s London. Although they do not match the many descriptions from sightings over the years, 
It is also interesting that the descriptions of the Jersey Devil at birth were of a reptilian. While this description is likely describing the likeness of the Devil given the number of sightings of reptilians, it is still something worth noting. Also, the connection to old pagan rituals and esoteric knowledge is interesting. Such thought outside the accepted norms of the Quaker society was frowned upon. This is much the same in any social setup. Those who operate beyond these boundaries are seen as crazy, eccentric, and at worst, evil. Was the Jersey Devil a way to keep the population in line? Or is it possible that the Jersey Devil, whatever it might be, has been native to this area long before the pilgrims and settlers came ashore from Europe? Perhaps this strange creature that befuddled and terrorized the local population was connected to Daniel Leeds for no other reason than to label him and his ideas evil, and in so doing providing an explanation for the worried masses, as well as issuing a warning to others who might choose to indulge in such evil practices as Daniel Leeds. Whatever the real truths under the stories, the sightings continue. And we'll look more closely at some more of those sightings when Weird Darkness returns. Weird Darkness is celebrating its ninth birthday this month, and we mark that on our calendars by holding a fundraiser each year in October. We raise money for organizations that help people who struggle with depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide and self-harm. It's called Overcoming the Darkness, and you can make a donation right now at WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. A gift of any amount will bring us that much closer to our goal of $5,000, and every dollar you give helps someone affected by depression, so no gift is too small. You can help us celebrate the podcast's birthday, celebrate the darkness of Halloween, and also help people climb out of the darkness that they're trapped in. To donate or get more information about overcoming the darkness and watch a video I created about it, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. The fundraiser ends Halloween night at midnight, so please, give right now while you're thinking about it. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Overcoming. While some Jerseyans embrace their devil as nothing more than a quaint figment of our collective imagination, a source of unification and pride, and a unique and important piece of New Jersey folk culture, others see it as a very real creature and a threat to their safety. Still others who have sworn they did not believe in the existence of the Jersey Devil have had their minds changed after spending just one moonlit night in the Pine Barrens. There, where a ghostly mist drifts across the cedar swamps and the unearthly cry of some unseen creature can be heard piercing the stillness of the dark forest, few disbelievers can be found. Whether it's deep in the pine barrens or deep in our collective unconscious, one thing is certain – the devil still lurks in New Jersey, and most likely always will. Here are a few true accounts of people who believe they have seen the legendary monster. Mary Reitzer Christensen. This has haunted me since it happened in 1972. I was a senior at what was then Glassboro State College. I had heard about the Jersey Devil when I came to South Jersey, but being from North Jersey, a different world, I thought I was far too sophisticated to believe in such humbuggery. One winter night, I was driving to Glassboro from Blackwood on Green Tree Road. At the time, the road was flanked by orchards and farms. There were few houses, and there was hardly any development. I was completely sober and awake when I caught a glimpse of something in my rearview mirror. Curious as to what it could have been, I slowed down to take a gander. 
It was dark out, but moonlit enough that I had no trouble at all discerning the upright figure of a creature crossing the road from one side to the other, roughly 25 feet behind my car. The figure stood taller than a man by far and had thick haunches, similar to a goat's, supporting its nearly human-looking torso and huge, woolly head. It moved heavily and didn't seem at all disturbed by my being there. I didn't linger long enough to see much more. I hit the gas and flew to the Mansion Park apartments in the borough. So petrified was I that I slept the rest of the night in the car, unwilling to get out in the same darkness that had introduced me to the Jersey Devil. Never again from that day on have I ridden on Green Tree Road day or night that I haven't gotten the heebie-jeebies just thinking about that winter night so long ago. From Keith I spent a lot of time in the Pine Barrens when I was growing up in New Jersey and had my share of strange experiences. When I was about 13, I went camping alone near Hampton Furnace. I had a bow with me and went looking for a rabbit dinner about an hour before sundown. Something started following me back in the trees. It tailed me back to my camp and circled while I cooked my dinner. This kept up until about two hours after dark, and let me tell you, it was one dark night. I finally decided that my visitor had moved on and crawled into my tent. When I just started to calm down, I heard a foot stomp down right behind my tent. I got all set to jump out when this thing, whatever it was, started screaming. I would compare the volume of the scream to a large truck's horn. I couldn't decide what to do. I had my bow and knife, but they didn't seem like much. After several blasts, it just stopped. I didn't hear a sound except my heart for about an hour. I was sure that if I stuck my head out of that tent, I'd lose it. In the morning, I could find no tracks in the pine needles. To this day, I still don't like sleeping in tents. I'd rather take my chances in the open. From Kelly As a native of Cape May County, I've had the typical rite of passage trip to the Pine Barrens, the legendary home of the Jersey Devil. This Jersey girl went to Cape May County Technical High School, which sponsored trips to the Pine Barrens for good grades in certain classes. I was one of the fortunate students to go three times during my four-year career at CMCT. Each time I went on this trip, my canoe was followed by a heavy-footed thing. With each step, I heard branches snap under its feet, uh, hooves. Every ten minutes or so, I could hear deep, beastly growls that to this very day give me the creeps. Being in a canoe and on a class trip didn't afford me much opportunity to flee in terror, so I stuck it out. For three years. Every year it was the same. During my sophomore year, I was pretty confident about my canoeing skills, so I didn't look over my shoulder much. I went canoeing with a friend of mine when we came across a bag that had been torn open and gone through. Around it were prints on the ground that looked something like a horse's hoof, only bigger. Then I heard it, the cry that still haunts my dreams, part human, part beast, and full of anger, pregnant with pure hate. I nearly flipped the canoe. We left, leaving whatever it was out there behind, or so I thought. It seemed to follow us. Every time we stopped or paused, it got closer to the river. We pushed on. Then worse came to worse as we tipped the canoe. I heard the thing running behind us and thought for sure we were dead. Then we righted our canoe and got into it as fast as humanly possible. We finally made it out to safety, sun fried to a crisp, missing all of our valuables and most of our clothes, but never happier to be on shore. We packed up our bus and left. As we were leaving, I rested my head on the window and saw a little cottage. I looked at it until the bus was about to pass it and saw a woman. She looked back at me and I could see her skin was torn and bleeding. After the bus passed, she vanished. Scared me so badly I wouldn't go into the woods for a year. From Sunny Z let me tell you of a sighting of the Jersey Devil. I was driving up Route 9 in Bayville at around 10 p.m. There were two cars in front of me and we were traveling about 35 miles per hour. To the right of Route 9 is a mini-mall type building with woods behind it. To the right is all woods. All of a sudden, I saw this big thing running across Route 9. It looked like one of the classic pictures of the Jersey Devil. 
It had no tail, no fur, its ribs showed, and it had a long, odd head with short ears that laid flat. It almost was ten feet tall. I noticed it because the first car stepped on its brakes, as did the second car. When I looked ahead, I saw this thing galloping across Route 9 and straight into the woods. I was not really scared because it didn't register yet. I stopped to mail something in the mailbox about 300 feet from the main road, and I saw a child's shirt, shorts, and one sneaker lying on the ground. I mailed my letter, ran into my car, and laid rubber all the way home. I was certain that I had seen the Jersey Devil. No one believes me. They say it was a deer. I have never seen a deer that big, that fast, or that weird-looking in my life. What is really creepy is that the other two people driving in front of me stepped on their brakes, so they must have seen it too. From Megan I actually have two stories about the Jersey Devil. The first one is my own experience. As a little kid, my parents took my family camping every summer around the Pine Barrens. One night, as we all slept in a big tent, I woke up to the sound of what to me was like a woman screaming. It was a blood-curdling scream over and over again, but I was the only one awake. I thought, being the naive child I was, that a woman was being attacked by a wolf. I don't know where I got that conclusion, but it must have been from the screams. No one believed my story, ever. As I got older, I became more interested in the Jersey Devil legend. Many of the stories were people talking about the screams they hear in the pines at night. As they described them, I got chills because I knew what they were talking about. A few years ago, I was talking to my uncle, who was from Pomona, and he compared what I described to what he also heard growing up in the pines. This leads me to my other story, which is his experience. He said that when he was growing up, he had this dog that would stay by him all the time as he played out in the woods and fields around his house. One day, while he was on his porch, he could hear those same screams coming from deep in the woods, and his dog ran out of sight after the noise. Apparently, the screams got louder, and the dog scrambled back to the porch with his tail between his legs and never left the porch again. As hard as he tried, my uncle could not get his once faithful dog to follow him into those woods. So maybe this isn't any hard evidence, but it sure as heck is weird. There's no doubt in my mind that something exists out there. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find information on any of the sponsors you heard about during the show. Find all of my social media. Listen to audiobooks I've narrated. Sign up for the email newsletter. Find other podcasts that I host. Visit the store for Weird Darkness merchandise and more. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories on Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes. Legends of the Jersey Devil was written by Marcus Louth for UFO Insight and Mark and Mark for Weird New Jersey. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Revelation 20, verse 2. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And a final thought. Sympathy for the devil? I don't think so. God from the movie The Jersey Devil. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.